Welcome to Tangential Soup, a weekly podcast discussing life in Australia, technology, food, fitness and the like, hosted by myself David Caddy, Melbourneian, independent developer and tea enthusiast, as well as my good childhood friend, Alexander Carr, Sydney cider, karate practitioner and lover of adventure. <laughs> Alex, I sent you a video from Marcus Brownlee, otherwise known as MKBHD, on the Galaxy Fold, which these aren't reviews, but at least people have got it in their hands now. Yeah. And I just thought you might be interested, because I was. It looks pretty good, actually, I have to say. It, it, yeah, it does look It does look fairly nice. Um, I mean, the thing that I just thought when I saw it, which again, I think we discussed previously, is it's you know, it's not a small piece of technology. Um, no, it's quite and even chunky. when the f- yeah, when it's when it's folded, um, it's so thick. It's more it's more of a kind of a a, a square shape than or kind of a, a box shape, shape yeah. Than, cubed, yeah, than uh, than it is flat. Um, you know, having said that, it's really cool to see the phone actually just sitting there with a crease in it. It's you know, this is this is the future. It is the future. Yeah. Um, like- it does look so stupid when it's folded over though, and it's got like that <laughs> little bit, this kind of sandwich shape, where it's slightly wider at one end. Um, yes, to allow for the slight curvature in the screen, um, yes. like like uh, Microsoft's Surface Book. When it closes the hinge, it closes all the way at one end, but then there's still a little loop which makes a kind of triangle wedgy shape yes. all along one yes. side. Which does balloon yes. it out even more. It still doesn't look too bad. Although the, the the small screen on the front does look kind of funny with such massive bezels at the top and the bottom. But I'm not like hundred percent sure why they had to do that. Um, yes, yeah. And the um just the way that when it's when it's folded out, I don't know why they've done it, but the the screen isn't actually what do you call it? it um it's not a it's not a rectangle, it's not an exact rectangle. It's got that kind of chunk taken out of the top right hand corner. Well, they did that because they wanted um, the screen to go to edge to edge as much as possible. Right, okay. And for this new screen technology, they don't have any way of, uh, you know, with the, the more recent Galaxy devices of just having a tiny hole in the screen for cameras, and they still wanted a front-facing camera when you're in sort of the tablet mode. Right, okay, okay. So that was the trade-off that they made there. They could have had like a thicker bezel all the way up the top or something. But I guess they feel like that would have wasted even more space. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they did what they did. But you're right, it does look pretty big. Yes. Um, and, I mean, I can kind of see... Like, it's not wasted space, obviously, because you can kind of have the, the clock stuff and everything up the top as well. And I see that when it's, you know, when it's being used functionally, you can actually drag it down and everything kind of adapts. Mm. Like that kind of top drag drop-down area. It does kind of adapt to that area, but I don't know, it's still... It still looks a bit clumsy. There's a lot of refining here to do, obviously. The software seems like it works fairly well, though. Like the sort of whatever they call it, the expanding from the single, mm. s- the small screen to the big screen when you open it up, it almost seems seamless. Like even in their demos early on, it seemed like it took a little bit of time, but they've cleaned that up and it seems to work pretty well. It actually looks remarkably good, I've got to say. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, once you start loading it up with a thousand pictures and everything, <laughs> that's the real test because you see how it runs after. Yes. So yeah. It's had a bit of use, but um, you know how we saw it uh, in this video, and I, I'm sorry, I don't even know who um, who did this video. If it was a promotional thing by Samsung or or just a normal user, um, but you know, he seems fairly happy with it. He's a really good tech YouTuber. I'm surprised you haven't come across him before, Mark oh, okay. Brownlee. Yeah. yeah. No, I haven't. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, overall, there's a lot, there's a lot that could be better, but I think it I still looks to me at least to be very good, and uh, everything I'd expect from a, how much does it cost? Three, two thousand dollars, no, two thousand dollar phone. 2000. Yeah. yeah, that's US though. By the time okay. it's our price, it's about two and a half, I guess. Oh yeah, probably even more than that, right? Mm. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I like it. I wouldn't get one, but uh, I can certainly understand why people would get one. I don't think they'd be disappointed if they did. I think we'll talk about this again in a few weeks' time when the the reviews are out. 
It's probably even yes. less than that, another couple of weeks' time. Yeah, um, yeah. Interested to see what it looks like. Yeah, me too, me too. Fire of Notre Dame, Alex. This is yes. an incredible story. Breaking today. Breaking today, yes. I, I woke up with the news. Um, it's always funny when you wake up with news like that. Do you, Everyone has their, you know, their September 11 kind of stories, but I, I remember waking up and my parents kind of talking about it. Um, I guess they'd seen it on the news or something like that. And at the time, I didn't really understand the significance of it. And I'm pretty ashamed to admit that I really don't know anything about Notre Dame, or at least I didn't until it burnt down today. Um, I've been to I've been to Paris, but I don't think I actually visited Notre Dame, from memory at least. In you my, your opportunity in my travels, now. Well, I have. For the original version. In, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in my travels through Europe, I, uh, I visited a lot of churches uh, and they all kind of melded together. So I possibly did visit it, but I don't really think it left a very strong impression on me if I did. Um, having said that, there's almost a century's worth of history sitting there. So it's obviously a huge loss from that standpoint. Do you know why it is so well known? Like, I think I mainly know it from Hunchback of Notre Dame. That's what I was thinking, that the book, which was later turned into a uh, a Disney film. But it, I'm sure it has much more significance other than that. It must. I, I thought you were going to lead with something as to why. But no. <laughs> I don't know anything else. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, there's, there's kind of a lot of old history across, across Europe. Um, but Notre Dame certainly is one of the better known uh, c- cathedrals. Hmm. Is it? A cathedral or church? Not sure exactly what it what it's classified as. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some fairly graphic footage of, of the uh a massive of the blaze toppling over. Like although yes. I heard about it, I didn't actually look at the footage until when you sent me that link a little while ago and like the whole thing basically went up. Well, that's what really makes me wonder because you'd assume I mean there are requirements for all modern buildings to have uh to have you know certain to meet certain fire safety standards right and I think a lot of those standards have to do with actually having inbuilt fire suppression mm. stuff inside them but um I mean I would assume that Notre Dame didn't have that because it just burns so easily no it wouldn't but I'm still surprised with such I mean not that I'm 100% familiar with its internal structure but I I would imagine there's a lot of open space and it's like brick mostly or stone. I'm surprised that went from literally one side to the other side. Well, I guess so rapidly before the fire brigade could really react terribly effectively. Well, yeah, my understanding is that it's it's got this kind of stone outer structure to it, but the inside is all wood and that's why it burns. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, well, that would make sense. I don't. I don't know what they used to treat the wood, but maybe it was it was, uh, it was treated in ways that. <laughs> that's why it burned so quickly. <laughs> you solved it. It seemed like they were doing work on it, were they? They were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, there were there were um, there have been ongoing works to uh, to the cathedral itself, um, and uh, from what I read, because I did I did try and look into it a bit before we before we did this podcast and. Uh, it seems that they have no idea what actually caused the fire, um, but they suspect that it was something to do with the restoration works. Mm. Um, and, you know, I mean, it could have been a million things. What occurred to me, though, was really there were a lot of candles that you light in uh, in churches, right? And, and I think I think it was still open because mm. I saw pictures from people who had been inside it um, just a couple of hours before. So while they were restoring the outside of it, the inside was still open. I mean, it could have just been a dropped candle, really. Yeah, it could have been. It could have been anything, I suppose. Hopefully it wasn't, uh, you know, nefarious. Well, they don't seem to think it was, um, but I mean, they don't, they don't really know at this stage. But uh, no. uh, it's always sad. Um, they did do a good job to save the facade and the two main spires. Well, they did, yeah, didn't they? Um, mm. Especially considering how furiously the blaze was burning. Mm. Um, they lost one spire. They did. They did. Yes. Um, uh, but they didn't lose those kind of two those two main columns or, yeah. columns or whatever, which is which is I think the kind of main structural standpoint of the of the yeah building. probably what everyone thinks of when they think of Notre Dame. Well, 
the people who have either watched the film or read the book, maybe. Yes. <laughs> um, and Macron said he's going to rebuild it. Yes, he has, yeah. And I also saw that a, uh, a French billionaire has, has uh, um, uh, you know, put aside $100 million or given $100 million of his own money to restore it. So, you know, that's nice, I guess. It'll make a bit of a dent. Yeah. It's always hard restoring those old buildings, especially with so much damage. Yes, yeah, well, that's it. Um, and, you know, Paris is one of those cities that's just soaked in kind of that historical... Uh, stuff and um if you think about it i think paris was bombed during world war Two, wasn't it so it has survived world war Two. it survived whatever else has come before that and uh and now it's just been knocked down by a presumably an accidental fire yes well i suppose things don't last forever well they don't do they no no it's uh it will happen to all things in the end mm. i might try to put in a few more fire safety features in the rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> a few more sprinklers. A little less petrol. <laughs> Honestly, just without the petrol, I think it'd be way safer. Would help. <laughs> yes. Did you see these social media laws that were put through Parliament a couple of weeks back or a week ago? Um, look, I saw them pop up on my newsfeed. To be honest with you, David, I didn't open the article until you brought it up with me. Fair enough. Not that I'm saying they're not important, because uh, because obviously this is something that will have a very profound impact on us. I think I just uh, my eyes tend to glaze over a bit when this when I'm when I'm reading these kind of things, as I'm sure they do for a lot of people. Yes. Um, but I did obviously for for the point of this podcast make an effort to read the the laws, and um, I mean my understanding is that they're to do or they're laws that really affect primarily. Um, is it workers? It's just workers or executives from social media platforms, yeah. Um, who who now have who now have a legal obligation to uh, remove certain uh, certain certain um, media from their platforms um, within a certain amount of time. Is it? Sorry. I'm yeah. Exactly so you you're kind of right. Um, you're being a bit vague because it kind of is a bit vague. <laughs> so to summarise for anyone that may not have heard this come through, this is in response to the obviously awful tragedy um, in Christchurch, the mass shooting, mm -hmm. and a response to the gunman live streaming the events on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the parliament has rushed through. This is only in Australia to put through these this new legislation that basically says that if you're a social media company, your executives can be charged and sentenced to up to three years imprisonment and fines of up to 10% of the company's revenue if they don't remove abhorrent, violent material expeditiously. Or expeditiously. Oh, yes, expeditiously. Yes. Yes, um, so that's basically what it is, but it's kind of not defined. And uh, I think it is it Josh Friedberg, the uh, sort of tech guy, <laughs> whatever the name of that office is. Um, I think he was asked about it to sort of clarify what it meant, and he sort of. He said, okay, I don't really, don't think I can say what it is 100%. But then he said, but I don't think Australians would have expected or would find it acceptable that this video of this incident, the Christchurch incident, was live on Facebook for over an hour. But I don't know, Alex, this is, it's just so rushed. Like this was put forward by the Liberals and Labor has even agreed that it's, pretty terrible but they put it through because with the election so close this is obviously something that the liberals wanted to rush through before the election and labor didn't want to stand in their way because then they'd kind of feel like oh so you actually think this is a good thing to have spread all over the place and of course no one does like this sort of content absolutely should be taken down mm -hmm. um 
but to have these massive consequences for all social media and it's not even social media it's basically any site anywhere any service that you can upload video or photos to basically any user content and it's kind of crazy and not very well considered because honestly i think facebook did a pretty damn good job they took down 1.5 million copies of that video within 24 hours and that's with it all being changed and rearranged to sort of defeat their auto-tagging algorithms. Um, I know everyone wants them to do better, and they should do better, and I'm not a fan of Facebook. But in this particular instance, I don't know if they really could have done that much better. Like with the amount of content that users put on a platform and technology where it is, even AI, like it's good. But like imagine YouTube, right? On YouTube users upload six hours of video every second i know there's no way you can manually check that no so you can't have it checked before it goes on and the process of having something taken down you've got to have someone you know recognize that it's bad content and then flag it and then probably multiple of those people to flag it to put it higher up in the queue before an actual moderator at the service will get to look at it and then can actually take it down. And so if you think of the timeline of this sort of event, obviously it's going to be shared first and foremost with people that are probably supporters of this nut job. Yes. And so, you know, for the first five, ten minutes, it's probably not going to get into the eyeballs of anyone that is any sort of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of people might start to see it and go, well, this is shocking and awful. And a couple of those might actually, you know, press the little button to report it and then a couple more and then like within an hour or just over an hour, like that's not that bad, really. I don't know what you think about it, but with the amount, the huge amount of content that goes on there, how can you like rank it in such a way as so quickly to go, okay, we definitely need to take this down. Obviously, in hindsight, you can say, well, that's obviously should have been the priority. But to get to that point initially, I don't know if you can do it. And to have, you know, three years of imprisonment on the line for these executives. Like, imagine if you're a startup, how the hell are you meant to put the infrastructure in place to support this? Yes, yes. Um, look, I, I should start by saying that I absolutely agree with what you're saying, David. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'll give you a chance to speak now. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was... I agree with what you're saying. I, I think that the kind of the fundamental thing that has to be thought of when you're putting through a law is it has to be practical. Yes. Um, and I think that that's kind of what you're, you're talking about here. What they are trying to implement, they can't practically police themselves. They can't police it. So the government can't police it. Mm. The companies responsible for policing their own content can't police it. Um, basically... I suppose what maybe they're asking everybody to do is have everything reviewed before it's available for public viewing or public kind of consumption, I guess. But, I mean, that's not really practical given the fact that, um, well, you know, every company or every kind of service now has some kind of live streaming thing. And you can't you can't check live streaming before it happens. No. Um you can't really, as you as you said, you can't you can't keep an eye on everything that's on your site. You just have to. You really have to be more reactionary than anything else. So, and another thing that I think of when I think of this is, it just seems like a law that it would be really easy for for the government to abuse for their own purposes. Mm. I mean, I'm not sure that that's exactly why it's happened, but when things are so vaguely worded and when they're not you know, when, when they're not specific, when they when they don't address... I mean, this is trying to address what I suppose is a specific problem, but it's going about it in such a vague way mm. that really this could be used to persecute a whole range of people whose only crime might be to simply work for a company with not so great infrastructure in place. Exactly. And, like, don't get me wrong, I feel like these companies should, at, at a certain level, like when you're the size of Facebook and things, when you've got a certain, you know, reach into the community, I think you should be held accountable and there should be 
pressure put on them mm-hmm. to do the best they can. Absolutely, yeah. But like, it's not 100% well-defined what content this is talking about. Mm-hmm. It's not defined at all what expeditiously means. It'll be reviewed <laughs> on a case-by-case basis, and yes. it could mean anything. Um, there's no protections in here for, like, whistleblowers. Um, what about things like police shootings? You know, that's in the public interest. Is that Could that be su- suppressed under these things? Of course. Um, yeah, it's just... It's, it's scary stuff. Like, if I was tomorrow say that I want to build a social media network, like, I just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Because it's just, what, what do they want here? They basically want, I think the way that it's currently structured, if anyone at all gets, you know, actually charged under these laws, like, a Facebook just going to pull out of Australia, you know, like, just not make the service available? I almost would be tempted because we're not a huge population, really. Like, they would earn a decent amount off us, for sure. Mm -hmm. But this is just, it's craziness. Um, Look, I'm in full agreement with you. It is is quite insane. Um, I I mean, I, like, I agree that we have to, we have to try and make, I guess, our country equitable for for, for companies to run in and... uh, and the laws have to kind of support support that. I don't really think that, that should be a primary concern when you when you make a law. Like the company's or a company's ability to to profit in Australia shouldn't really come above the interests of a lot of things. At the same time, I do understand where you're coming from when you're saying that that, that companies might pull out. Um, I mean, for me, that isn't a huge concern though. I just think that the law itself is so poorly conceived. Well, this coupled with the terrible encryption laws that were passed last year that are now under review i did yes i do i did i did notice we're just so tech hostile at the moment to be honest we should be forward thinking like we have a small population we don't have much in the way of manufacturing or anything we could be leaders in so many aspects i think in renewable energy and just technology in general and like, again, I'm not saying this should, it should be, like, open slather. But, like, well, like with um, drone technology, we've actually been kind of ahead of the game and getting decent legislation out there, and now Google is operating a delivery service in Canberra, although, albeit at a very small test scale. Mm-hmm. But stuff like that, when we do it well, we do it very well. But that's sort of more at the, the state level, but it seems like the federal government, just really doesn't understand technology. Did you hear um, Bill Shorten say you could charge an electric car in eight minutes? I I didn't, no. <laughs> um, it doesn't surprise me that he said that, though. On radio, they asked him, you know, what was the ballpark? Because he was sort of spruiking, you know, how good electric vehicles are and that, and they are, that's good. But then the host said, oh, so how long would it take to fully charge an electric car? And he's like, oh, well, it depends on the level and things. But, you know, if you get the infrastructure in place, you can charge it in eight minutes. And while superchargers might be able to charge things to sort of 70%, 80% in maybe 15 minutes or something, so it's not crazily, you know, <laughs> wildly wrong. Huh? For the average consumer who's not going to put on three phase into their home, it's really going to charge overnight. Like, what... Can you think of any consumer electronic that you will charge in eight minutes? Like, it's I just... No. Where did he pluck <laughs> that number from? It's like he doesn't understand anything about technology. I mean, I don't like the liberals, but I don't like Labor. Ah. I'm glad you told me that, though, because I, I don't know how long it would take to charge. I would assume it would take a long time. I know that you plug them in overnight. But exactly, but that would have been your guess, right? You wouldn't have gone, well, it could be eight minutes. I would have guessed a few hours maybe based on my phone. Yeah. That would have been. <laughs> exactly. And that would have been, you know, far more reasonable. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say, Australian politicians a lot of the time I feel don't really get it. Um, and Turnbull, when he introduced the encryption laws and they said to him that, you know, it's just the laws of mathematics that when you have end-to-end encryption that it can't be spied upon there's no way to get access to that data and he's like well that's all very well and good but in australia we obey australian laws <laughs> <laughs> a 
Australian laws trump yes. laws of mathematics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, look, honestly, David, I didn't realise it was quite that dire. Um, I didn't realise that Australia was quite so 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 tech adverse, actually. Um, I mean, where are we compared to... Because I know that there was a big thing in America around... Um, uh, what is it, the, the net neutrality or something like that? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a big thing, right? Because it, it kind of, I don't know, had some privatizing effect on, on internet and allowed it to be tiered and everything like that. Yes. How do we compare to America, for example? I'm pretty sure those type of activities go on here just as much as the States. And so coupled with these other things, I would say we're worse than the States. Oh, really? Currently. Thank goodness these encryption laws are under review, and I feel like they'll either be changed heavily um, or just overturned entirely. And I feel like the same is going to happen to this in due course, right? It's like one of those things. We rush it into legislation, (laughs) we get it approved, and then we figure out, you know, all the things that are so terrible with it. It does seem like a ridiculous thing to do. Do you know the political motivation behind it? Why exactly the Liberals would... Would put so much effort into Well, I think it's an easy kind of win, right? Because, like you said, it's sort of slipped past you in the news cycle what this actually means. Um, and so you get a nice headline out of it. You say, the, the Liberal government has pushed through this legislation to prevent what everyone can agree was a terrible thing. Um, mm. Not talking strictly about uh, the Christchurch shooting, but the streaming of that event on social media, yeah, which yeah. I think no reasonable human being would be in support of. I know there's freedom of speech and things arguments, but I don't think in this case you would kind of go anywhere near that. Mm-hmm. Totally take it down. So you get the nice headline saying the government is taking action to ensure this won't happen again, which is wrong because it will happen again because you can't actually stop it. Maybe it'll be taken down slightly quicker, but it's a lovely headline and Labor didn't want to get in the way of that because otherwise the headline would have been Labor stops, um, you know, prevention measures for this awful thing. So they just it push is it through. the worst kind of politics, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, I, I understand that. And that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, and, you know, it's something we should all be involved in, obviously, which, I'm, yes. which I am which I am not. I applaud the idea, but the execution is just so, so terrible. Yes. What would, what would you like to have seen happen specifically on this? Just, just more talk, more figuring out of things. More, more talk, more, um, you know, sort of involvement with the tech community and the broader community. Cause basically I think a few people within the liberal party drew this up and just lobbed it into parliament and everyone yeah, went, sure, that'll, that looks good. And there's no real tech ex- experts in there. So there's not really good representation. If there is, like, you know, you only need the majority. And the majority of people aren't going to be aware of what this actually means in the tech sector. So you need to do a little bit more research, get some representatives. Yeah, I think right. that's true in basically every legislation. Well, it is, isn't it? Because, I mean, ultimately they're asking them to police these laws themselves. But it also needs to be more well-defined, right? Like, expeditiously, that means nothing to actually define what the content is you're talking about. And I don't think the imprisonment is really fair, necessarily. Like, it's kind of like you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent, right? If you find any sort of abhorrent content on a service you could potentially charge these people and then they have to attempt to prove that they were doing the best they could and they kind of fit into this expeditiously category. It's, uh, I know they wanted to put the imprisonment on there to make the stakes high and I think that's kind of good. And the 10% of the company's revenue, I think that's, you know, that's pretty good. Like Facebook is worth a fortune and that sort of also scales from the small people to the big people. Like... Wouldn't you agree that having something like this shared on Facebook indefinitely or for any length of time is far worse than a tiny startup social network with three users? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yet, the potential 
max thing would be the same for everyone. And they may or may not take that into consideration, but that hasn't even really been worded properly in this legislation. Like, it's so vague and wishy-washy that basically this has to go to court to prove any sort of kind of, I guess, precedent. And that's true of any legislation. But when it starts out so poorly, I don't know. It's it's a bit of a dog, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, 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 I fully agree with you, yes. And, uh, you know, I think the kind of weak politics that you get from... Uh, that you get from from these kind of things is always it's always incredibly disappointing to me but uh and i mean obviously you're kind of always going to be more across tech news than me well i know and i'm um, sure this stuff happens all the time and i'm just not in the industry that it's affecting so i guess i care less or i don't understand it as well well yeah that was that was going to be my other point i mean it's always you know like a lot of things like these they make the headlines and then you find out about them but how much does it happen behind the scenes where you just don't notice it i wonder how much of our of these kind of bills are passed that we just don't pay any attention to and that we don't actually properly read the wording of that is just terribly defined mm. and then you know end up being at huge disadvantage for everyone uh for everyone else mm. which is very sad actually another quick thing um, about this legislation is that you they also have to report as soon as they become aware of it these this kind of con- content uploading to the federal police which is fine however in the states they have legislation which you have to report these kind of incidents to their national police but only their national police i guess from a terrorist angle so literally facebook could not actually obey these laws so it's going to be interesting <laughs> <laughs> like are they going to they're going to be slapped by the US government or by ours okay um, alright fair enough uh, it's just so stupid isn't it mm. how would but there are so many things that are going to be reported to them I know how is the police possibly going to keep track of that I know yeah. are the police going to have to build some database and then just sort things by priority or something i mean that's another you know from a practical standpoint it hasn't been thought through like to support that type of activity you probably need to up the funding of the police and actually have probably a dedicated department they might actually have it now but probably massively expand it yeah and yeah yeah. so when you rush something through all this stuff kind of i don't know falls by the wayside yeah yeah Yeah. well hopefully Hopefully it will uh, it will be reviewed and uh, something. It will be. be. It. it will be. And like it's probably in some ways, you know, to wash it through and then get it modified so it actually makes sense and then have something, as opposed to you know, working on it for years and then never kind of putting anything in place. Maybe it's for the greater good, but they could have done a better job of this and still got it in before the election. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely agreed. Thanks again for joining me, Alex. Not a problem, David. Pleasure as always. You can follow and get in touch with us on Twitter at Tangential Soup, and you can find this week's show notes for more information about today's topics at tsp.fm slash 209. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with anyone you think might also. And we'll talk to you again next week. Bye. Ciao.